The Tom Woods Show, episode 498. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. If the idea of getting paid for doing absolutely nothing appeals to you, then you're going to love Ebates, where you get cash back just for shopping that you're going to do anyway. Check it out through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. Welcome to another episode of the Tom Woods Show. What an episode it is today, indeed. A debate over the Article 5 Convention. Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution lays out two different ways that the Constitution can be amended. One way involves the initiative of Congress, that Congress sends out an amendment to the states. But another way, which has not yet been used, involves the states on their own initiative gathering together in convention to adopt amendments. And this has been a subject of debate, uh, often not direct. Uh, one person will write an article, and a year later somebody writes an article. Uh, it's very rare to see two people on opposing sides of this question facing off in a debate. Because on the one side, you have people who say, we need the convention because there are structural problems in the U.S. government, the, the Constitution needs to be changed because either because previous amendments have deformed it, like the 17th Amendment or whatever, it, it simply is, is not working, so we need to change it, and Congress is not going to take the initiative to change something, given that Congress is the problem. On the other hand, you have people who say, there's no way to limit a convention like this, is there? Couldn't the convention become a runaway convention? coming up with all kinds of crazy and dangerous ideas for the, for the United States, and we have to protect against that by coming up with other means of fixing things other than using this convention option. So, today we're going to hash this out with two people you will enjoy hearing from. The first is, and I introduce him first because he's taking the affirmative in our debate, Kevin Gutzman, who is chairman of the Department of History at Western Connecticut State University. You've heard Kevin on this program several times talking about different topics. Kevin is the author of numerous books, including James Madison and the Making of America and The Politically Incorrect Guide to the Constitution. Also joining us to argue in the negative is William Jasper. Bill Jasper is senior editor of The New American Magazine, the publication of the John Birch Society. You can find out about The New American at thenewamerican.com. Bill is the author of the books The United Nations Exposed and Global Tyranny Step by Step. Before I invite these gentlemen on, I want to tell you about two freebies I'm giving away. One of them you normally have to pay for. It's my book Real Descent, subtitle A Libertarian Sets Fire to the Index Card of Allowable Opinion. And it's all about topics that we're not allowed to discuss because the New York Times does not approve. Well, the Kindle edition of that book, Real Descent, is now available for free for a very, very limited time, for just a few days over at Amazon. So you go to Amazon, type in Real Descent, and get the Kindle edition for nothing. You'll see the price will be $0.00. Very, very limited time. Go get your copy of Real Descent. I, th there's no secret money I get from this. I get nothing. It's a zero price. I get nothing. I just want to give it away for a few days. So that, there's that. The second free book I'm giving away is an evergreen freebie. It's always free. And that's my book, Bernie Sanders is Wrong, covering all the topics he brings up and refuting them all. You can get that over at BernieIsWrong.com. How about that? BernieIsWrong.com. Or if you're a texter, you can text the name Bernie to 33444, and you'll get that freebie. So get these freebies, because they're free. Why the heck not get them? All right, let's talk to these gentlemen. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Happy Pleasure to be, to be here. here. All right, this is a debate topic that people have been asking about for a long time. They want to know what my own opinion is and what should they think about it. So I thought, let's bring on two people who have been identified one way or another with this topic. And I guess will formulate the debate in the following way. We'll say, resolved uh, an Article Five convention, which could be in the form of the particular proposal that Kevin supports, uh, can be a good idea for the cause of liberty, can advance the cause of liberty. And I will take Kevin as taking the affirmative and Bill as taking the negative. 
Kevin, I think, though, because people don't necessarily know about the particular version that, that you happen to be associated with, why don't you take 30 seconds to explain it and give the, the URL so people can know about it, and I'll link to it on the show notes page, and then we'll get into the back and forth. Well, the effort is called Compact for America. Actually, Compact for America sponsors an idea called Compact for a Balanced Budget, which is an attempt to use the Constitution's interstate compact provision to arrange a one-off Article 5 convention whose sole purpose would be to vote yea or nay on a specific balanced budget amendment proposal. So far, four states have adopted the compact legislation, and it's an ongoing effort. All right, very good. So people know that what you're talking about primarily is the Compact for America, but that you have not ruled out and would not say that it would necessarily be a bad idea to have a more open-ended Article 5 convention. I don't necessarily need to commit you to that here, but uh, either way, we are talking about a convention as envisioned under Article 5. So l let's, uh, let's turn things over now to Kevin, because you are taking the affirmative. I'll let you start, and you can talk for two minutes, telling us, uh, give us your pitch for why this is a good idea. Well, I think that, uh, in general, people recognize that the federal government is following an unsustainable path. Presently, the unfunded obligations of the federal government are estimated at over $220 trillion, which is 14 times GDP, or more than the entire gross economic product of the entire world. And so I favor an effort to use the unused section of Article 5, the amendment article of the federal constitution, to require the federal government to live within its means. The reason why I favor having the unused portion, the state-initiated portion of Article 5, be used for this purpose is because, as George Mason recognized in the Philadelphia Convention, where Congress is the problem, it's extremely unlikely that Congress will ever provide the solution. So it seems to me that the Madisonian approach here, having discovered through use of the Constitution that it has an imperfection, no limit on the federal government's capacity for borrowing, we need to change the Constitution to make it impossible for the federal government to leave our children in an economic situation akin to that of Zimbabwe or of uh, South Africa or of Puerto Rico or Detroit. And... That's why I favor this effort. Wow, you have, for the first time in the history of the debates on this show, you've come in under your allowable time. Okay, that's good. You don't get to keep that. You get no credits for that. All right, let's turn things over to uh, Bill Jasper now. Uh, Bill, you have two minutes to caution us about this idea. Okay. Before amending our Constitution or taking the even more perilous course of calling a convention to revise it, I think it's important to ask some hard questions. One, does the federal government, by which we mean the Congress, the President, the federal courts, follow the Constitution now? Two, let us suppose that after an enormous expenditure of time, effort, and capital, we are successful in amending the Constitution for the better. Is there any rational hope that any of these same three branches of the federal government would suddenly obey the newly amended Constitution any more faithfully than now? Is the problem the Constitution? Is it defective or deficient, or is the problem ultimately the American voters, us? We who, whether through ignorance or apathy, continue to elect those who are supposed to follow the Constitution and do not. Is it not we, the people, who are deficient in our vigilance that we have allowed the federal politicians to usurp power from us? Four, foremost in many minds, as my opponent has said, is the looming nightmare of the trillions of dollars of our national debt that are coming due. Is a balanced budget amendment the answer? Well, we are drowning in debt because around 80% of our national budget is for unconstitutional spending. The balanced budget amendment does not end any of these unconstitutional agencies, programs, or spending. A budget can be balanced by raising taxes, which is most likely what politicians would choose over cutting spending. Moreover, all of the balanced budget amendments also have an escape clause for national emergencies. Correct me if I'm uh, wrong on this in the particular, this particular case. But we have been officially under continuous state of emergency for the past several decades. 
Finally, a convention risks throwing our entire Constitution and our liberties into serious jeopardy through a runaway convention that cannot be restricted to do what its promoters claim it will do. All right. Those are our opening statements. I'm going to give each of you a minute to respond to uh, the other. So, Kevin, you have one minute. Well, there are several ideas in that statement that uh, bear some consideration. The first is the last, the idea of uh, a runaway convention. Of course, a runaway convention is not possible under the uh, Compact for America model, which is binding federal law requiring that the convention take up only the sole issue of voting yay or nay in our proposed balanced budget amendment. The second point is that one often hears from opponents of a state-initiated amendment process that um, terrible things might happen if there were a convention, that a convention can make any kind of proposal at once, and so we must not risk having one. Assuming even that we were talking about an open convention without a compact limiting its agenda, uh, this uh, raises the question, well, isn't it true that Congress also can propose any amendment it wants? The logical conclusion from this objection is that we shouldn't allow Congress ever to meet either because Congress is constitutionally entitled to make any amendment proposal it wants. Even if Congress were to make uh, an undesirable amendment proposal, of course, the idea, the idea here is that the states would ratify such an amendment proposal. We also have the statement that, well, of course, it's useless to amend the Constitution because the people who are in federal office don't follow the Constitution anyway. And this is true only in regard to the rhetorical or the statements of principle in the Constitution notably the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment isn't, isn't followed because it doesn't have an enforcement mechanism. There are, other, there are many provisions of the Constitution that actually are followed all the time. For example, Congress never sends to the President's desk for his signature a bill that's only been passed by one House. The bicameralism re requirement of the Constitution is followed perfectly in every instance. And, of course, we know that there are many other structural provisions of the Constitution that all are right, followed, All right, ding, too. ding, ding. I already, I already let you go way over because I thought it was good material and it was a crime to stop you. But now, now, you're, now you're abusing your power, Kevin Gutzman. So uh, because I'm such a softy of a moderator, Bill, I'm going to let you also take two full minutes if you want to, to go uh, fully against Kevin. And then I'm going to give you, after your two minutes, an opportunity to ask Kevin just straight on, anything you want to ask him and force him to answer it. Okay, go ahead. you got two minutes. All right. Well, uh, first of all, the, uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention uh, cannot be limited by uh, state resolutions, state laws, uh, any of the proposals that are, that are uh, proposed. That, has been, uh, that is the uh, opinion uh, put out extensively by the Congressional Research Service, giving the history of all of the calls for a convention and all amendment processes. That is the uh, opinion of the Supreme Court. And we know that in the case of who will actually decide what the rules are of a convention once it is called, uh, that it will end up being Congress, which is the, uh, the one who actually makes the rules of the, of the convention. Uh, the, the Congress, uh, according to the Necessary and Proper Clause, uh, is the department which has control over the, uh, the, the rules or the laws that will govern it. And we know that in, a, in the event that, that a, the, the convention is called, uh, all of the forces who are opposed to uh, our Constitution, who want to uh, liberate it from all the checks and balances that are currently opposed upon them on their exercise of power, will use every maneuver possible, including taking it to the courts and uh, per persuading the courts, which will not take a, a very uh, difficult long time for them to to do, they will get the courts to go along with them in exercising congressional authority over the convention itself. So we are not getting away from uh, congressional uh, misbehavior now by going into a convention. All right, Bill, so is, go ahead and pose to Kevin the most challenging question you can think of on this. Well, uh, there are several, but let's just ask this. Um, in view of the fact that you are an expert on Madison, 
uh, and in view of the, you've written books, or at least one book on him, I know, and in view of the fact also that such highly promoted legal experts, so-called, as former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens, Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Lessig, University of Texas Law Professor Stanford Levinson, and Texas A&M Law School Professor Mary Penrose, to name but a few, have come out very forcefully and recently for radically overhauling the Constitution and wiping out many of our most basic rights, checks, and balances. So do you not, like Madison, tremble at the thought of a second convention? Or are our, more, our circumstances more propitious, as he put it today, than they were in 1787? All right, Kevin, you can take two minutes here, start up your clock, and go. Well, we hear some inconsistency in your comments. On one hand, you say that the Constitution is never observed. It doesn't have any effect on people. On the other, you say, well, we have these wonderful checks and balances that are in place, and, and we'd see them in effect if a uh, compact, an interstate compact were presented to Congress organizing a, a single-issue convention. There is, in fact, no apposite case law on the question of an interstate compact to organize a constitutional amendment convention because there's never been such a case. There's never been a compact for this purpose. You can't cite precedent where there is no precedent. Um, yes, it's true that there are radicals who want to change the Constitution. I would note for you that where people like Sanford Levinson, who was one of my law professors, Lawrence Lessig, with whom I'm familiar, um, and people like John Paul Stevens want changes to the Constitution, eventually what they do is they have federal courts declare that the Constitution means what they've always wanted it to mean, regardless whether we've changed it, regardless whether they've rejected amend we've rejected amendments that they've proposed. This is the method they consistently use. Now, you mentioned Madison. Madison's response to a situation in which the Constitution of the time, the Articles of Confederation, had proven uh, inadequate to its purposes, was to seek changes to the system. We now have the Nobel Prize winning work of uh, James Buchanan, the economist, who showed us that once you have a constellation of political incentives and once you have a particular political system, you're going to get essentially the same kinds of results from it regardless who holds the offices. And we've seen in our own lifetimes that regardless of the fact that Ronald Reagan uh, won the election of 1980 and that his allies took control of the Senate, regardless of the fact that conservative Republicans came to control certainly the House of Representatives in 1994 with at least uh, grudging allies in the Senate, regardless of the fact that George... Okay, got to wrap it up now. Well, Watch that clock. Well, the bottom line is that just changing people who hold offices has, and even if the people themselves at large have wanted changes to the system, um, the changes to the products, the system being unchanged has meant that, that Buchanan's thesis has been validated over and over, just voting for different people, even when the people want change, has not brought change, and that's why the Madisonian solution is to change the system. All right, you're 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 over, so I'm going to take that as your question to, to, to Bill. Uh, if Given that we have attempted this uh, version of, of things, we've, we've tried to just uh, throw the bums out and elect new people, and no matter what happens, no matter which people we elect, the same results seem to occur, so why would we think that continuing down this path is going to make any difference? Well, uh, it's a, that's a, a very valid point that, of course, has very many people frustrated. But a part of the reason for that is uh, we have not uh, done more than just throw the bums out. Uh, we have to do the hard work uh, that the founders expected. That, that is, we have to not just vote uh, party line, uh, not just uh, go along with the party leaders, but we have to clean house. And uh, I've been working on that for 40 years. Uh, I, I would like to see an easier path uh, to, to go down. I think we have to uh, look back at what has really been done and say, hey, uh, it isn't that uh, the, the system is wrong, that the Constitution is faulty. It's that we have to start uh, applying it, uh, turn off the, the entertainment and get busy with saving, uh, saving the country. Uh, I think one of the, the things that uh, we should be looking at is there are things outside of the ordinary that we can be doing. Uh, you, uh, Tom, know about uh, nullification. You wrote a book on it. Uh, we've been very busy in uh, promoting that for many years. And state nullification 
is a way to uh, affect change. And most people are unaware that uh, we actually have been successful in stopping the federal onslaught, not by amending the Constitution with regard to real ID. Uh, we don't have to, every time somebody in Congress or the administration proposes some massive new invasion of our rights or our state uh, powers, uh, go into a, uh, a constitutional convention or an amendment process, the state simply said, no, we're not going to go along with the real ID, a national ID. And they still have not been able to, uh, to get it through. Uh, that the same thing is happening with uh, the uh, uh, drug decriminalization, medical marijuana thing. I'm not necessarily in favor of many of these proposals, but it shows that it can be done at the state level. The federal government, the federal Leviathan, can be uh, uh, can be defied. It's also happened with the uh, gun manufacturing laws. Those states have said, "No, feds, you can't come in here and regulate our guns if they're made and stay within our state." There's many areas where we can actually be applying those things that are already available in the Constitution. All right, let me jump in here. Kevin, I want to ask you specifically a question, then I've got one for Bill. It's I understand one of your arguments is that a lot of the fears that people have of a convention are misplaced because they're saying things like, oh, they'll do terrible things to our Constitution, and who knows what, what will happen. But as you as you said, what would we wind up with under a convention that we don't have already? We already have a Congress that feels it can legislate on plenary matters. It can do anything it wants to. We already have a president who thinks he can deploy troops anywhere in the world he wants. Like We already have the nightmare scenario that people are painting as the outcome of a convention. We have that today. I get that. But there is a part of me, though— that thinks it's not inconceivable that something bad could come out of a convention, given the woeful state of political and philosophical education in America, the fact that most people, if they really understood what the Constitution said, would go screaming in the other direction. That Basically, it, it says almost everything the federal government is doing, and all those checks with your names written on them, are unconstitutional. Most people wouldn't want the Constitution, even if, they, if it were presented to them. So if something came out of a convention that said we need a more egalitarian society and we need this and that uh, program officially enshrined in the Constitution, you're telling me it's unlikely that the states would ratify that? Well, um, two things. Number one, of course, that's not um, the effort I'm uh, No, I understand. I'm talking more theoretically. Well, I think the, the, the issue is weighing uh, the risks against the rewards or weighing the seriousness of the situation we are actually presently in. You know, when I hear people say, well, we don't have real ID because of state government resistance or we're having medical marijuana approved in various states, I have to think they don't think that our current situation is actually that bad, right? $222 trillion in unfunded obligations are a calamity. This is far worse uh, in comparison to the national uh, budget than the Greek debt situation, and yet people say, well, maybe the federal government continues to plan to send, you know, boatloads of money to Mars and to build schools in Afghanistan and to send old Americans on vacation for 20 years on the, on the tab of the younger generation, but at least we don't have real ID. I think that the situation we face now is entirely fraught. It's going to lead, ultimately, if we don't do something about it directly, about the budget, about the debt, this is going to lead to some kind of military government. It's going to lead to an unrepublican America. We have to have immediate response to this problem. Now, we've had Madison's name mentioned a couple of times in this conversation. Madison could have said exactly what my uh, colleague here has been saying. Well, you know, if we just teach the people to abide by the Articles of Confederation, the Articles of Confederation are perfectly good. We don't need to change them. We just need to have people elect people who will comply with the law. Madison's idea was, well, no, clearly the experience of the Articles of Confederation has shown that they're inadequate, and the only way you're going to end up with the kind of government we need is to have a different system. Right? We need to make changes to the fundamental law. Gentlemen, we're going to take just a minute for this message. Hey, everybody, if everything goes according to plan, later this year I'm going to be creating a website to teach you how to earn money online while avoiding scams. And I mean by things like learning how to self-publish a book 
or how to earn money through blogging or how to earn money through a podcast or how to earn money through affiliate marketing. I'm going to write the definitive guide, at least the definitive Woods guide anyway, to a lot of these different subjects and then just give them all away for free on this site. But another thing I'm going to do is compile all these ways that you can make really, really easy money by doing pretty much nothing. And I keep harping on Ebates because it's such a great example of what I'm talking about. You don't have to really do anything. You just sign up at Ebates, and then pretty much almost anywhere you would shop online, you're going to earn cash back. It's crazy not to do it. So check it out through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. All right, uh, let's see. I think I want to ask... Uh, I think I'll ask Bill a question, and then I'm going to let you guys kind of go back and forth. Uh, Bill, based on what I just said, that there really it doesn't seem like there's all that much to be afraid of, given that if I'm to believe the New American Magazine and I'm to believe the John Birch Society, things are about as bad as they could possibly be. So how much worse could a convention make them? Well, uh, as you know, if you've, if you've read, read the magazine, we, we have not uh, been uh, cheering on this uh, devolution of our country and our economy uh, over the last four years. We've been reporting on it, uh, declaiming against it, etc. However, uh, it is very clear on both from uh, the the forces on the left who are for total government, who are against all restraints on us, who want to have, in fact, many of them have proposed that we have uh, gay marriage uh, written into the Constitution, that we have the inclusivity, etc. All of this, uh, all of the Obamacare and all of the wish lists of the collectivists uh, put into law, they would like to see all restrictions swept away. Do we still have some uh, semblance of constitutional limited government? Yes. Do we still get challenges from uh, states when federal government oversteps its mark. Yes, unfortunately, not as much as we would like to see. Um, we are seeing a, and have been watching, a, an unfolding, folding, rolling uh, juggernaut of the federal government taking over more and more of our lives, taking more power, taking more and more of our incomes. And it's, it will reach a point at which it is completely untenable and liberty will go by the wayside. That always happens. The will to power will exert itself. And so uh, what then is the solution to uh, throw the whole thing uh, uh, up in the air and allow the, the forces with the most power? Now, perhaps uh, 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 those promoting the Constitutional Convention for a balanced budget uh, think that they will be able to uh, control it. I, I really don't think so. I think all the media is against. They're in the Obama camp and in the left-wing uh, camp. You're not going to get a whole lot of resistance from the Republican leadership. And I, my question uh, would be, I don't know about uh, the particular BBA balanced budget amendment that you're proposing, uh, Kevin, with the compact, uh, but does it have a, an emergency clause in it? Yes, it does. And, and we have been in a state of national emergency for uh, terrorism because of Burma uh, human rights. One up for the last uh, for, uh, 30 different or 40 different uh, national emergencies that are still ongoing, that are renewed every year. Uh, that observation isn't relevant to the provision of our proposal. And why asked, would it not be? Well, because what you're talking about are situations in which the federal government has decided to give the federal government more authority by declaring emergencies, quote unquote, which would empower the federal government. And what and, our and BPA would, says, and we would suddenly have a different uh, federal government that wouldn't uh, engage in those kind of usurpations under the new BBA. No, no, we wouldn't, because it wouldn't be up to the federal government to decide whether there was an emergency. It would be up to the state legislatures, of whom a majority of state legislatures would be required to say there was an emergency in order for the federal government to spend more money. In other words, our proposal represents a, a turning back of the clock to the days before the 17th Amendment when ultimate control over federal spending was in the hands not of people in Washington, but of people in state legislatures. In other words, it would be up to people who didn't have an incentive for the federal government to spend more money to allow the federal government, in case of emergency, to spend more money. And you can bet that people in Hartford or people in 
Austin or people in Sacramento would be slower to say, well, it's time for the federal government to spend more money than those guys in Washington who get to be on the front page of the paper or have their building on their their name on a new building or have their name in the newspaper um, just saying what wonderful statesmen they were. Uh, it would be certainly far less likely that we would have this kind of a situation uh, in case the, fed, the state governments had the old check on the federal spending. So, uh, in other words, as I said earlier in our conversation, it's true that the federal government, 90% of the line items in the federal budget are unconstitutional, but the reason why that can happen is that it's the federal government that decides how much power the federal government has. It's the federal judges who have the responsibility, which they have not observed since 1937, of saying, here are the limits of federal power. But if you change the system, if you put actual checks on the federal Congress, if you said, no, you have to abide by this limit on the debt, and the only way around it is in time of emergency, and we name two or three kinds of emergencies, one being, of course, a, an unanticipated war, um, it's up to the state legislatures to decide that there's an emergency. I think it's very unlikely that state legislators would vote to declare a federal emergency unless there actually was a military uh, conflict. So this... Well, I, this I, is, I live in, I live in uh, what is considered by many people to be one of the most conservative states with one of the most conservative governors and state legislatures. I live in the state of Idaho, and our governor, unfortunately, has uh, uh, caved into the federal government because he wants the federal the federal money. Uh, our state legislature has likewise uh, on a number of cases uh, uh, cases. And so we have we have the. It seems to me our position is that the federal government is. Uh, far too large right now. It is spending 80%, over 80% of it on unconstitutional agencies, departments, uh, programs, etc. A balanced budget amendment that allows all of these uh, to stay in place does not remove any of these federal agencies that allows uh, the, the spending to go on. Well, I don't believe that that's true. Uh, I think, for example, I was actually just having a conversation about this with my uh, my history students yesterday uh, at the university where I teach. It seems to me that the way the uh, the structure of the government works now, if your state, say, elects somebody like Raul Labrador and sends him to D.C., um, and he votes against this kind of spending, people back home think if the bill passes and the federal government is still lobbying out money through the Department of Education or the Department of Agriculture, which, of course, Idaho is a big recipient of or, or uh, some other federal bureaucracy, they expect their cut of it. They're not going to turn down the money because the money is being spent whether Idaho accepts its share or not. That's a different kind of situation from one in which the question is, shall we have a break put on the borrowing? Shall we say enough of this borrowing in general? It's not just that Idaho decides Idaho would rather have its money, uh, its share of the federal largesse apportioned out among Connecticut, New Hampshire, and uh, Kansas. Instead, the question is, shall we stop the borrowing altogether? I think people need to realize that presently the unfunded obligations of the federal government come to over $700,000 per American. In other words, if you're a family of four, your share of that is just under $3 million. Now, does anybody think that there's any way that the federal government can continue with plans to send people to Mars and, and give everybody 20 years of vacation and, and raise the amount of money they're spending on wars and so on? Does anybody think this is possible? Can America avoid the effect of mathematics forever? What about the answer is no, it can't. Right. Well, uh, the, I'm with you. I'm with you completely on that. It's the it's the the method and the route to uh, getting back to sanity. That's the question here. Uh, I have uh, and, and this really gets to the concerns that many of us have. And again, I'd, I would recur to Madison, the same uh, letter that we're referring to. He's talking about a, a, a second general convention. And he said if it were to come about, Quote, an election to it would be courted by the most virulent, violent partisans on both sides. It probably would consist of the most heterogeneous characters, would be the very focus of that flame, which has already too much heated men of all parties. It would no doubt contain individuals of insidious views 
who under the mask of seeking alterations, popular in some parts but inadmissible in other parts of the union, might have a dangerous opportunity of sapping the very foundations of the fabric. So what uh, do you think why, the why, do you, why do you not see the same thing happening uh, this time? Madison was actually concerned that if there were a second convention, the central government would end up with less power than he wanted it to have. And I say, good. If there's another convention, I honestly think the federal government would end up with less power than it has now. And the alternative, you know, here's, the, I think one of my main points of frustration with people who make the argument that you're making is the assumption that somehow the left doesn't get whatever it wants anyway. I mean, just think back to America 30 or 40 years ago. What was the most uh, common epithet that people called each other? Okay, now that's a right. You couldn't make a more absurd, um, you couldn't make a more absurd scenario up for the extension of federal authority than what we have seen in recent days. There is simply no limit to the legislative power of the federal courts who, whenever they feel like it, completely remake the absolutely most basic laws of the state governments. There is literally no limit on the war-making authority of the president who, without even so much as a nod toward the Congress, felt free to go overthrow the government of Libya. Okay, there's just well, no okay, limit. Okay, but then don't you, don't you uh, agree that there would be one or two or three or four or five justices on the Supreme Court who would find uh, penumbras emanating from the Constitution to allow the Congress to uh, uh, exceed a balanced budget amendment? I mean, we're, no, I we're, putting, so. a lot of, we're think... putting a lot of effort, we're calling for putting a lot of effort, time, and and expenditure into uh, accomplishing something like a balanced budget amendment, which I don't see it as having a, a, a snowball. All right. Well, we lost Bill at the end there, but I, th- I guess we know what is just uh, is uh, Kevin. Well, uh, actually, I don't think it takes a lot of effort. So far, we've had four states pass the legislation that's requisite for it, and once it, it is ultimately uh, adopted, the compact will require a meeting that will take one day, and they'll vote first that they have a quorum, and secondly, yes or no on the amendment. This isn't a huge effort. It doesn't take a lot of time. You know, and again, people could have made the exact same com- uh, objections to adopting the current U.S. Constitution as you're making to amending the current U.S. Constitution. Well, we already have a Constitution. Well, we know these guys in in, uh, Philadelphia are ignoring it. Well, if only people would elect people who would do what the Articles of Confederation say, we'd be just fine. There's no reason to have any kind of change. It'll cost a lot of money to send people to a convention in Philadelphia. We don't know what those guys will do. They didn't even know they were going to be behind closed doors. And who knows? Maybe when they get through with it, they'll give more power to the central government than we wanted. It'll overthrow the revolution. I think things are going just fine now. We don't know what will happen to our rights if we have a new constitutional convention and so on, right? The same exact argument. But the point is... But we are not facing the the same exact circumstances. No, we're not. Those already in Congress have already shown that they want more power, that they are not going to relinquish it. Uh, Yes, right. You're, you're underscoring my point. We have well, more experience. I, I, no, I think I think you're I think you're missing it there. Uh, not here. only not only the Wolf Pack and John Paul Stevens and others that are that are pushing for, uh, and all the Soros funded fronts are are going to be there uh, at the convention. Also, you think that uh, your folks are going to be able to. Uh, to run the convention and do better than the founding fathers did and keep powers in check rather than uh, see the other side actually be able to sweep away what remains of our tattered, battered constitution and all, what few uh, remnants of restraint that it offers. All right, listen, I'm going to say, just so for the sake of both of your time, because I did make promises to you both, Kevin, take two minutes to, to uh, wrap things up, and then, Bill, I'll give you two minutes to wrap things up, and we'll call it a day. Well, I, again, I don't accept a lot of the premises of what Bill's saying. First of all, uh, he says um, 
essentially that the federal government does whatever it wants. And then he says, but we don't want to try to amend the Constitution to rein in the federal government because we'll lose this wonderful Constitution that limits the federal government. My point is, that's just inaccurate. It's inaccurate because ultimately all three branches of the federal government feel entirely entitled to do exactly whatever they want. And Buchanan, James Buchanan, the economist, won the Nobel Prize for an insight that was absolutely accurate. Once you have a certain set of incentives in the political system, once you have a certain structure of government, it doesn't matter whether the, the Speaker of the House is Tom Foley or Jim Wright or Newt Gingrich, you're going to get the same kind of product. You're going to have the same kind of situation. And this is exactly the, the insight that led people like Madison to say, we need a change to this system. We need actually to, to make the structure fit the times. We've had insights since the time of the Founding Fathers. You know, uh, a minute ago, Bill tried to put me in opposition to the Founding Fathers. You think you're going to do better than the Founding Fathers? It was the Founding Fathers who gave us the amendment provision. It was the Founding Fathers who wrote Article 5. They thought that once the Constitution was put into effect, imperfections would become evident, and we could correct them. But what we've decided to do instead is we see gaping holes in the constitutional system. We see that it's just putting, it's going to make serfs of all of our children because 700,000 each in unfunded obligations, and what should we do? We should say, oh no, we should freeze the Constitution in amber while the other side is ignoring its most important limitations on the federal government, its most important protections of our rights. We should say, well, we like the form of it, even if it doesn't actually, I don't know, work. So let's not change it. I think that is a mistake, and the Madisonian solution is a remedy that takes into account the experience we've had since the Constitution went into effect. That's why I favor a balanced budget amendment. All right. Uh, before I go to Bill, I'll tell people that anything that either one of these gentlemen would like me to link to on the show notes page so people can find out more, for example, the Compact for America, anything Bill wants to link, any articles, uh, link to the New American, that'll all be up at tomwoods.com slash 498 so you can read more about what these gentlemen are saying. Bill, the last word goes to you. Well, again, I would uh, draw back to uh, medicine. Uh, as uh, Professor Goodson knows, uh, he uh, mentioned that a constitution is a parchment barrier. It, it, that is, it is a piece of paper. The constitution is not self-enforcing. The constitution uh, does not prevent uh, the government from doing bad things. That's our job. We, they give us the law. We have to then use it. If we are remiss in our duties, as Americans woefully have been for decades and generations, allowing the siren song of government uh, benefits and various government perks uh, to dull our, our sense of jealousy of our liberties, we gradually lose them. And that is what has been happening. The, the uh, various branches of the government have uh, taken over. They've uh, usurped their uh, authority from us, from the states and from the people, and we have to take it back. My opponent says that uh, the best way to do that, or the way he's advocating, is to uh, have a convention for a balanced budget. Uh, that, uh, to me, seems uh, frightfully dangerous. There are still remnants of the Constitution that we can use, which is why so many people on the other side who want all restraints removed would like to see, are hoping to see, are working to see, that, it, that all of these are removed in a new constitution. They have very powerful uh, forces on their side. John Paul Stevens, and who's advocating getting rid of the Second Amendment, uh, he has six amendments that he's calling for. Uh, he has many allies in the major media, the academia, and the think tanks, and all of the, the, the punditry out there. Uh, we have uh, still constitution to hold to. We still can use it and work with it. It's going to require Herculean effort on our part, but uh, we need to save it. All right, and that is that. Uh, again, tomwoods.com slash 498 is where you can find out more information about this entire discussion. My thanks to both you gentlemen, uh, to, to Kevin and to Bill, for making the time to do this, and I know everybody will benefit from it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.
All right, everybody. I do this every single weekday. We cover some interesting topic related to liberty. So make sure and subscribe so you don't miss an episode of the show because you're becoming smarter with every single episode. What fun we have here on the show. Remember the freebies. Bernie Sanders is wrong at BernieIsWrong.com and my book Real Descent, which is not a free book normally, but is temporarily a free book. Check that out at Amazon, typing in Real Descent and getting the Kindle edition for yourself for free. All right, that's it, everybody. We'll see you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.